Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. And this is a, such a great pleasure to gather on this Sunday evening to hear about the ways that we are called to be church in every corner of the globe. Uh, my job, I, I'm Ivan Herman, I'm the associate pastor here at Corner Market Presbyterian. My job is to let you know where the restrooms are. <laughs> Just outside the side door in the hallway, there are men's and women's, you're welcome to, to get up as you need to do. And, uh, uh, and we certainly welcome you all here. Many of you are Corner Market folks, but many of you have come in from the community, from other churches in the Presbyterian. And we certainly do welcome you this evening. I invite you, uh, let's join together in a moment of prayer as we begin our time together. Holy and loving God, we thank you for this time to take a break from the way that we live our lives day to day and to see how it is that you are working through this church in our neighborhood and in the neighborhood of our world. We ask that you would open our eyes and our hearts to the way that you continue to move in our midst. As we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I'd like to introduce, although I won't actually introduce, but welcome, Reverend Kate Tabor, who's a mission co-worker uh, for the PCUSA in Israel, Palestine. Kate, you can do your own introduction. Okay. Let them know anything you think would be um, interesting about yourself, and then uh, what, you, what the work is that you're called to do. Thank you. Good evening. It's truly a joy to be with you all. Um, we had a, a, a couple of days ago when we thought I wasn't going to make it to Sacramento and to Carmichael, so I'm so grateful uh, for the flexibility of this church um, and those hosting me, and really glad to be with you. Um, recently, I played host to a group of staff uh, visiting from uh, the Presbyterian headquarters in Louisville, including our... Is the sound kind of echoing? It's a little too reverberating, I think. Be back. Be patient with us. Have grace, we would say. I'll just turn it off quickly and speak loudly for a minute. He's turning it down. We are testing the microphone. Does that, is that, can you still hear me? Okay, we're doing well, thank you. Um, as I was saying, recently I played host to a group of uh, staff uh, from Presbyterian headquarters in Louisville, along with our newly elected moderator of General Assembly. Um, one of these staff told me he had avoided visiting Israel-Palestine for decades because he said his heart belongs to Latin America, and he was wary that if he visited Israel-Palestine, he'd leave part of it there. Um, but over the course of this week, he worshipped with our mission partners in Israel-Palestine, broke bread with them, prayed with them, uh, raged and wept with them, and he said, by the, at the end of the week, he said, my heart never had a chance. And I really couldn't have found better words to describe myself, the experience that I've had learning about and working and volunteering and living in Israel-Palestine, and I'm so happy to share some with, it, with you tonight. Um, as was mentioned, I'm a mission co-worker for the Presbyterian Church USA's uh, World Mission. Uh, and my job title is a bit of a mouthful. I'm the facilitator for peacemaking and mission partnerships. Um, I live in East Jerusalem, Palestinian East Jerusalem, with my husband, Nathan Stock, who works for the Carter Center's uh, field office there. Um, but what does it mean to, be, uh, to have this mouthful of a job title? Um, well, like all mission co-workers around the world, one of my responsibilities is to have relationships with our uh, global Christian brothers and sisters. Um, so in Israel-Palestine, that is the Christian Palestinian population who are uh, witnessing to Jesus Christ in the land of his birth since the time of his birth. Um, beyond just Christians, sorry that you have to crane your necks to the right. <laughs> I don't think I gave them sufficient notice that I had a presentation. Um, beyond just Christians, I'm also called to be in relationship with all people living there who are uh, w doing work that's in, within the goals and values of our General Assembly uh, policies. So that includes Israelis and Palestinians of all faith and non-faith backgrounds who are doing work for justice and peace there. 
So about half my work is holding these relationships and trust for the Presbyterian Church, and the other half of my work is directed toward Presbyterian Americans back in the States, um, both connecting them with what we call the living stones of the Holy Land. Uh, we use this phrase because so many people visit uh, the Holy Land on pilgrimages as if it were a museum, and it just held buildings and stones from the past. Uh, and they don't bother to look up and see the living people living in the land around them, um, worshiping and vibrant and living uh, congregations. And so I always encourage folks who are coming to the region to meet local people, the living stones of the Holy Land. Um, I, I'm also there to be an interpreter of the local context to Presbyterian Americans, um, helping people understand the context in which, our, in which our mission partners live and work and worship, um, which includes helping people understand uh, the conflicts there. I feel especially called to this work because of my background, um, learning about this conflict and living there previously. About seven years ago, I was starting seminary right out of college, and I knew nothing about this conflict and nothing about Palestinian Christians. I, I then started seminary, and I, a, a confluence, a, storm, a providential storm of events happened um, that really brought it to my attention. I met a couple of friends who had volunteered and lived and worked in the West Bank. I also started, uh, I was in a class and read a book by a Jewish American theologian um, who reframed the conflict in a way I had never heard before. I also uh, began attending worship at a congregation that had recently gone on a fact-finding delegation to Israel-Palestine, and they came back all fired up wanting to preach and teach about it, and I, I began attending right when they were doing so. Um, so as a result of all these things happening to me within the span of just a few months, I could tell that God was bringing my attention to this conflict, um, truly. Um, and what I learned was a narrative I had never heard before. The narrative that I'd known about this conflict, and which I still believe to be a, a completely legitimate and an absolutely compelling narrative, is the dominant Jewish narrative, um, which is all that I had known. But because of these experiences I was having, I was becoming familiar with a, a new narrative to me, the Palestinian narrative. Um, and this narrative also begins with uh, ancestors that the Palestinian trace, Palestinians trace back to the times of times before the Bible, um, followed more recently by the migration of Arab Muslims in the 7th century, and even more recently by the Ottoman Empire that was ousted after World War I and replaced by the British Mandate. Um, the British Mandate was simply an, yet another foreign power occupying this tiny strip of land um, in, in a line of many empires doing so. Um, but there was an increasing number of immigrants, Jewish immigrants, coming from Europe fleeing persecution, um, desiring a, a homeland. And as these uh, waves of immigrants uh, increased and increased, they started to clash with the indigenous population. And so did the, the British representatives on the ground. Um, so much so that the British decided they didn't want to be responsible for this problem anymore. And they bumped it to the newly formed United Nations. The United Nations came up with the plan you see up here on the screen. It's the UN Partition Plan. Well, in hindsight, this plan looks pretty good. <laughs> but at the time, uh, the plan gives the blue area, which is about 55% of historic Palestine, um, to a proposed Jewish state. And it gives about 45% of the land in the brown to a proposed Arab Palestinian state with an internationally controlled Jerusalem you see in red in the center. Um, now, at the time, of course, the Palestinians controlled about 95% of the land and made up even more of the population. That's a vast majority. So you can only imagine what it was like for them to have the United Nations, these foreign powers, come in and suggest that they give up 55% of their land to immigrants. Um, looking back, we wish this plan had taken this plan had been accepted, um, but we can understand why that was unacceptable and offensive to them at the time. And so clashes increased to the point that a war broke out in 1948. Uh, this war is known to Israelis as the War of Independence that resulted in the establishment of their state. But of course, it was a very different experience for the Palestinians. They refer to this war as the Nakba, or the catastrophe. And over the course of this war, over 530 Palestinian villages were displaced and destroyed. Over 33 massacres have been documented by Zionist militias against Palestinian populations. 
and it left three quarters of a million Palestinians as refugees. And so this is truly a devastating, catastrophic experience for the Palestinians. I just have a couple of pictures of the refugees from 1948. So at this point, we are on the third map from the left. Um, in 1948, Israel took about control of about 78% of the land. And this 78% is what the international community recognizes as Israel's borders. Um, in 1967, during the brief Six-Day War, among other territory, Israel also occupied the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, the green areas um, in, the third, in the third map. Um, which, which was the other 22% of the historic uh, Palestine. So at this point, uh, this brief war led to even more refugees and an Israeli military occupation of those two territories and the entire population that lived there. So since that time, the Palestinian population have lived under 47 years of military occupation, during which they've continued to lose land and homes and lives. Um, they've experienced increasing restrictions on their movement through the highly regulated permit system uh, that allows Palestinians to move from one place to another uh, via permits they apply to from the Israelis. Um, also segregated roads, over 400, 500 checkpoints and roadblocks, um, and within the last decade, the erection of the separation wall, um, of which only about 15% of the wall lies on this internationally recognized border. Uh, the other 85% snakes into the West Bank, into Palestinian territory, and effectively an annexes land and settlements and resources for what you would imagine would hopefully be a future Israeli state. So all of these restrictions serve to uh, provide lots of obstacles to Palestinians' daily lives and their access to a lot of services, um, natural resources, of course, but also employment, education, health care, other family members, and religious sites. They've also experienced mass incarceration. There's a lot of statistics around this, but um, one stat says that 80% of Palestinian men have been arrested at least once in Israeli jails. So at this point uh, in time, we are looking at the reality of the fourth map from the left, the last map, uh, with uh, all of these restrictions creating what you see, these little pockets of Palestinian control that don't result in sovereign borders they don't result in control over natural resources like water. They don't result in any contiguous state. Uh, folks cannot get from one Palestinian area to another on highways that Palestinians can use. So, it's, so it does not present uh, any Palestinian sovereignty or viable state or viable economy. Now twice the Palestinians have mobilized to resist this occupation in various ways. Um, they've been called the intifadas, one in the late 80s and one in the early 2000s. Um, but neither, as we know, have resulted in a Palestinian state or freedom for Palestinians, but rather they've resulted in a vastly disproportionate loss of Palestinian life and only further restrictions under the occupation. Meanwhile, refugees still wait for the right, re the right of return that's been granted to them by UN resolutions and by international law. Um, many remain in camps that were built for temporary use in 1948. At this point, they estimate that anywhere between five to eight million refugee, Palestinian refugees live worldwide, and they make up a third of the global refugee population. So this is the narrative that I was confronted with this first semester in seminary. Um, I really had known nothing of this previously, and I found it incredibly compelling and, and really shocking that I hadn't known anything before. Um, so the more I learned, the more I wanted to know, until eventually after I borrowed all his books and documentaries, my friend finally said, Kate, if you want to really learn about this place, you have to go and see for yourself. And I think John and Ashley would uh, confirm that statement. So I, I went. And from my first day on the ground with Christian Peacemaker teams, you can see the delegation I went with on the bottom right picture. Um, this was in the summer of 2007. Christian Peacemaker Teams is an organization that has permanent 
teams in various conflict zones around the world, including Israel-Palestine. Um, but they also invite short-term delegations to come and be part of their work and learn about the conflict in which they're set. Um, and so I had about two weeks with them in Israel-Palestine. And the idea behind their work is that internationals can come into conflict zones uh, and come alongside vulnerable communities and provide a deterrence to violence and harassment that community might experience, but also to uh, document violations of human rights and international law and spread awareness about those violations. So that's the work that they do. But I really fell in love with the place when I went, the culture and the food and the landscape and the people, um, and I knew I wanted to go back. So I found out about an organization called the Ecumenical Accompaniment Program in Palestine and Israel, another mouthful, EAPPI. It's a program of the World Council of Churches, um, and it has very similar goals and, and strategies as Christian peacemaker teams, and I was able to be there three months with them, appointed in Bethlehem, and those are the pictures, the other two pictures you see. Um, our priorities in Bethlehem were to monitor the checkpoints, the huge checkpoint uh, that regulates uh, folks going between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. Uh, we were also there to support local non-governmental organizations and also to visit Palestinian villages that were being threatened by settlements and by the uh, building of the separation wall. So I came back and searched for yet another way to return to Israel-Palestine and went again on a year-long fellowship from my seminary. At this point, I was really craving uh, to know how religion was having a positive impact on this conflict because we know that religion is often manipulated to incite more violence in the midst of this particular place. So I went back to interview people who were identifying themselves as being religiously motivated to be involved in peace and justice work there. So that was a truly inspiring experience for that year. Then I moved to Atlanta and accepted a call with the church and got ordained and met my husband. And eventually together we, we together discerned a call to, to um, move back to Israel-Palestine in our different roles, me with World Mission and him with the Carter Center. Um, and I'm incredibly grateful for the, the call that I have there um, and my ability to be able to share with you in particular about our mission partners there, um, including Christmas Lutheran Church. Uh, how many of you knew there was a Lutheran de Palestinian denomination? And I would never have guessed myself. Some of you do know about it. Um, so, Chris, so the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Jordan and the Holy Land, a sister denomination, of course, of our ELCA here in the States, um, they've been around since the 19th century, uh, although I'm always careful to tell you that they were probably, um, all of them were converts from other Christian denominations and sects in the region. Um, my Christian Palestinian friends often say that foreigners come in and ask them, uh, when did you convert? And they'll say, Pentecost, <laughs> because of course they trace their Christian ancestry back to the very early church. Um, they are surrounded by the sites of Jesus' life and ministry and trace them, their, their heritage back to that point. Um, so the Lutherans were just simply um, one more manifestation of this Christian community, and they comprise about six congregations in Jerusalem, the West Bank, and Jordan. And I have the honor to be seconded to their ministries about a quarter of my time. Um, so when the pastor, Reverend Mitri Raheb, is out of town, sometimes I lead worship. Um, but I also work with an umbrella organization that, that comprises their outreach ministries called the DR Consortium. Now, this group of organizations under the church serve the local Palestinian population from womb to tomb, they say. Everything from youth empowerment programs to women's civic education to uh, wellness programs for the elderly. Uh, they also have a university college of arts and culture. And I'm always so moved when they explain to me why they focused on cultivating arts and culture within their society. Uh, first of all, they say that they need to uh, cultivate a culture of life when there's so much death around them. Um, they also say that it's important for them to celebrate the positive and beautiful aspects of their heritage and cultivate a, a positive Palestinian identity within their society. Um, so I had the privilege over the summer of working with the group of students you see sitting around me in the bottom right-hand picture. Um, these are all students of the arts and culture uh, program. Most of them were either music students or culinary students. 
And they had been invited to come to the States this fall, to North Carolina and South Carolina, and participate in some festivals of art and culture and share traditional Palestinian cuisine and traditional Palestinian music. And I was asked to help them work on their English skills to prepare for the trip, and also help them, uh, un help them figure out how they were going to speak to American audiences about their lives as Palestinians in their context. Um, so we had a lot of fun, and it was especially important for me to have contact with people, with um, average young adult Palestinians, especially uh, over the course of the events that happened this summer, as I'll talk more about. But it was a particularly important time um, to hear their perspectives. Um, in the, bottom, or the upper right-hand side, um, I'm helping lead worship in the sanctuary. Alongside to my right is the pastor of the church, Mitri Rahab, and to his right, is Reverend Victor McCary, who actually coordinated Middle East ministries for the Peace USA for 20 years. Um, he's an amazing man, an amazing resource. I have the privilege of working with him there. Um, he has retired, quote, retired, um, to work on a project with Mitri there on, on how Palestinian Christians um, work to, cre to, cre to participate in government and society in the Middle East. Another, we also have uh, mission partnerships with Israeli Jews as well. As I said, anyone doing work that's in line with our values and goals of General Assembly. And one of my favorite people, a good friend, uh, is Sahar Vardi. She is working uh, as the director of the Israel program for the Quakers' office in Jerusalem, the American Friends Service Committee. She is only 24 years old, <laughs> which I find amazing because she is the most articulate person I have met. Uh, to describe the ways that, that militarization uh, pervades all aspects of Israeli society and the detrimental effect it has both on the society and on prospects for peace. And she herself uh, began visiting Palestinian villages with her father when she was 13. Um, this is uh, an incredibly unique experience for uh, a Jewish Israeli like Sahar because for the most part, they, they would have no contact with Palestinians. Even living in a city comprised uh, 50, 40, 50 percent of Palestinians, um, all aspects of life are segregated from transportation to schools. Um, they just, maybe they would, they, they would meet a, a waiter, a waitress that was Palestinian, but they really would have no contact otherwise. And they definitely would not be visiting Palestinian villages in the West Bank. Um, but her father was part of an, orga an Israeli organization called Tayush, which means living together. And through this, we're doing joint projects with these Palestinian villagers. Um, and through this experience, she says that she came to understand how the occupation functions. And she likes to tell this particularly mundane story that I'm going to share with you. Uh, the, the main village that she visited was called Anuaman. Now, this village is between Jerusalem and Bethlehem, which is actually just a few miles apart. And the village sits on land that was annexed by Jerusalem in 1967. Annexed by Israel, I'm sorry. One thing I didn't explain earlier was that when Israel occupied the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, uh, it, it annexed, legally according to Israeli law, annexed East Jerusalem to beca become part of the greater Jer Jerusalem municipality and part of Israel itself. Of course, the international community sees East Jerusalem as being occupied territory, but Israel considers it Israel. So the land the village was sitting on was considered Israel, considered Jerusalem municipality, but they never counted the village residents as, as being there, as being uh, residents of the municipality. And so ever since, they've been considered to be living illegally in their own homes, in their village, even though, of course, the village has existed there since before anyone can remember. So this, of course, provides a lot of obstacles for these villagers. Every, Every year, they have to apply for a temporary residency permit to be able to continue living in their land. They have demolition orders on all of their buildings, many of which have been demolished in the past. And they have a checkpoint sitting on the only road that goes in and out of the village. And the soldiers at this checkpoint have a list of everyone who lives in the village, and they're the only ones allowed in and out. And they have a list of all the goods that are allowed in and out of the village. And the village is so small, it doesn't have a school or a clinic or, or a car mechanic. So for everything, these villagers um, have to leave and come back in through the checkpoint. And now, they do experience harassment and abuse uh, at the checkpoint, but that's not what this story is about. Um, in this story, uh, a villager called Sahar's father late at night and said, please, please help me. They won't let my horse back in. 
And so Hari's father was like, uh, what are you talking about? And the villager said, well, his horse had gotten sick, and of course there's no veterinarian in the village, so they took the horse to Bethlehem to be treated, and they were bringing the horse back into the village, and the soldier at the checkpoint is looking at the list and saying, I'm sorry, the horse isn't on the list, I can't let it through. And so, so Hari's father, of course, is trying to fix the situation. He, he and others call the government contacts they have, the military contacts, until someone gets hold of the soldier's commander, who straightens it all out, calls the soldier, and says, it's okay, it's okay, you can let the horse through, no problem. And the soldier happily lets the horse through. So Hari says she loves this story because it shows that even when the occupation is functioning at its very best, in this story, no one did anything wrong. There was no malicious intent by the soldier. There was no harassment. The soldier was simply following orders. Um, but, so this is the occupation functioning at its very best. And many times we know that it doesn't. But even when it does, Sahar says that you can see how a military occupation inherently violates uh, the freedom, the human rights, the dignity of the civilian population that it controls. So because of her experiences um, with this organization, Tayush, and visiting these villages, she decided that she could not, in good conscience, join the military when she turned 18 and was drafted, as all Jewish Israelis are, other than the ultra-Orthodox. So she wrote a letter to the prime minister saying that she was a conscientious objector because, because of the occupation, uh, and she was imprisoned twice uh, for this stand. Um, so she went on uh, to to support other refusers, and this is a, a large part of her work with the American Friends Service Committee with the Quakers. Um, and so she is a great resource for me on Israeli society and perspectives. Another historic partner I want to tell you about is Al Ali Arab Hospital in Gaza City. Uh, this, another thing I like to ask people is who knew there was a Christian hospital in Gaza that was a long-term mission partner of the Peace USA? Um, well, this hospital is the result of Christian missionaries from England. It's now a mission of the Episcopal Diocese of Jerusalem, which has also been a close partner of the Peace USA. Um, as I said, it's the only Christian healthcare institution in Gaza where there are only about 1,500 Christians in a population of 1.7 million. Um, but yet it, it stays strong. Um, and I want to give you, um, I want to tell you about a visit I had to the hospital in, in the, during the course of the war this summer. Um, but first, I want to give you a little bit of background on the events of this summer. I was over there, so I don't really know uh, how much most people knew about it here and what they, how much they knew about the context that led up to the, to the event. I believe that you had in your headlines a lot of the attacks that were going on. Is that the case? Yeah, you heard about it. Um, so we could trace the beginning of this summer's violence to a lot of starting points. One of them could be, of course, 1948, because two-thirds of the people who live in Gaza are refugees from 1948. They are not original residents of the Gaza Strip, uh, which is why you don't hear most people talking about Gazans, uh, because most people in Gaza are not Gazans. They are refugees from other areas. Um, as happens in all wars, uh, there's violence and chaos, and people flee their homes. Um, and often they would flee to friendly territory, behind friendly military lines. So in the case of the Palestinians living in what is now southern Israel, they fled to what we refer to as the Gaza Strip because the e Egyptian military was controlling that area. So it was behind friendly lines. And they took their house keys with them and they thought they would go back when the violence settled down. And they remain there to this day. And that's two-thirds of the 1.7 million people who live in Gaza. So that's some, that is some appropriate and relevant context uh, for the violence between Gaza and Israel to this day. Um, another starting point we could go to is, of course, the 2006-2007 period when uh, after Hamas took control, uh, Hamas took democratic control of, of uh, the Gaza Strip, Israel introduced sanctions against it and then a full blockade. And this blockade has really been devastating to the civilian population in, in the Gaza Strip. Um, Israel's controlled everything from uh, the coast and the fishing to the electromagnetic sphere, to the, the airspace, to three of the four borders. Um, they control how many calories go into Gaza per person. Um, they control construction materials that go in. What, what is allowed to be manufactured in Gaza. And of course, they disallow any exports out of Gaza. 
Um, and this has been going on since 2007. So you can only imagine the kind of devastating effect that has on an economy and on a, on a civilian population. Uh, so we can definitely trace uh, the conflict of this summer back to the blockade as well. But where I think it's most appropriate to begin is actually the summer of 2013. As you may know, uh, Egypt changed governments during this time to a government that was unfriendly, we will say, to the Islamic Brotherhood and to its cousin, Hamas, in the Gaza Strip. And Egypt shut down all the tunnels that connected the Gaza Strip with Egypt. And now this is really important because these tunnels provided, in the, in the midst of this blockade by Israel, these tunnels provided really the only pitiful, pitiful viable economy uh, that Gaza had. Uh, they got everything from construction materials to fuel to food to KFC, I hear tell, um, through these tunnels. <laughs> Um, so, and these tunnels were highly regulated. Um, there, was a, there was a tax. Uh, they had set up a whole customs area around these tunnels and they taxed uh, the goods coming out of the tunnels and going out, coming in. And this revenue, this tax revenue was the only revenue the Hamas government had. Um, so when these tunnels shut down, the government ran out of money and they couldn't pay their employees. And their, the gov Hamas government employees are everyone from teachers, to trash collectors, to police officers, civic, civic servants. Um, so since the summer of 2013, um, there was a huge section of the Gaza population who, who weren't getting any salaries. Um, at the same time, shutting down these tunnels meant that you no longer had access to a lot of the goods coming through. So the price of everything got higher. Uh, also because they didn't have access to affordable fuel coming in from Egypt. They had to buy fuel from Israel at twice the cost. And as you all know, when the price of fuel goes up, the price of everything goes up. So here we have a situation over the course of the, last, the whole last year, increasingly, uh, that people were getting poorer, um, they had less access to food and other resources, uh, and the prices, at the same time, the prices of everything was going up. So you have a very um, more increasingly desperate population. So of course, Hamas is looking for a way to, um, to satisfy the needs of their constituents. Uh, they were getting increasingly desperate. And so they made some truly historic compromises uh, with their uh, historic counterpart, opponent, uh, the Fatah party under the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. They agreed to dissolve their government in the Gaza Strip. They said, we will dissolve our, we will relinquish control of the Gaza Strip. We will submit to a unity government uh, with Fatah that will also control the Gaza Strip if on the basis of two promises by the Palestinian Authority. One, that the PA would pay the salaries of Hamas's government employees. Uh, and the second, that they would help ease the, the crossing between Egypt and Gaza. And by, by doing this, Hamas knew it could satisfy the needs of their constituents. Um, and so for that, they were willing to make these huge historic compromises and relinquish control. Um, in doing so, they were also submitting to the leadership of President Abbas, uh, which is a huge concession for them as well. Um, but in doing so, they were in essence submitting to what we refer to as the quartet principles. Now these principles are uh, conditions that the international community has required of Palestinians in order to consider them viable um, partners for negotiations. It's recognizing Israel's right to exist, renouncing violence, and agreeing to form a peace agreement. Um, so in, in agreeing to this unity deal, Hamas was in essence agreeing to these, these quartet principles, which is truly historic. Um, however, within a month, it became clear that the Palestinian Authority was never going to make good on those two promises they had made Hamas. They were refusing to send money to pay those government employees. Um, and they also had no, they were not making any progress uh, easing the, the crossing with Egypt. So at this point you have Hamas looking around. Uh, their people are getting more desperate, clamoring for change and help. Uh, the political option they'd come up with that was a huge uh, compromise for them was not working out. Um, in the background, of course, we know John Kerry's negotiations are falling through. Um, so this is a truly desperate time. And, and to enter into this, to add to this desperation, June 12th happens. On June 12th, as you may know, tragically, uh, horrifyingly, three Israeli teenagers were kidnapped from the West Bank. 
Um, we found out later that, that within hours they were likely murdered. Um, but under the guise of looking for them, uh, the, the, Israel launched a military operation in the West Bank, a huge crackdown on anyone affiliated with Hamas who they suspected of being involved. They arrested over 800 people, many of whom had just been released in a prisoner exchange. Um, they invaded lots of ho hundreds of homes and institutions. They ended up killing 12 Palestinians in, in the midst of these raids. Um, so four times the number of people um, kidnapped, they ended up killing. So Hamas has just faced this huge crackdown in the West Bank. Uh, can you imagine the desperation that they must have felt at this point? Then July 7th happens. Israel strikes a car in the northern Gaza Strip. It's an airstrike and it kills six Hamas men. In response, Hamas launched nine rockets into Israel uh, and they claimed responsibility for them. You may have heard rockets coming out of Gaza previously, but none of them had actually been uh, officially sanctioned or taken responsibility for by Hamas. Perhaps they let it happen or perhaps they couldn't control the population enough to prevent it from happening. Um, but these rockets on July 7th were unique in having been sanctioned and officially taken responsibility for by Hamas. And in response, the next day on July 8th, Israel declares Operation Protective Edge against Gaza. And that is the 50-day war that ensued. I don't know how much of this context you heard uh, here in the States, um, but these are the series of events that, that led up to this, to, this, uh, to this violence. So what did happen? Uh, I think you heard some about the destruction and the loss of life, but I just want to uh, give you a pic paint a picture for you of uh, how devastating uh, this war truly was and how it really broke down the fabric of life for every Gazan, for every person living in Gaza. Over 2,200 people were killed, two-thirds of whom were civilians, and over 500 of whom were children. Over 11,000 people were injured. 1,000 of the injured children will have permanent lifelong disabilities, and 1,500 children have been orphaned. 142 Palestinian families had three or more people killed in a single attack. 71 Israelis were killed, including six civilians, including a child. 500,000 Palestinians were displaced at the height of this conflict. And to give you a sense of, of what incredible numbers those are, I had a meeting with the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs after the conflict. They're the ones who monitor all of these numbers. And they told me that, of course, the United Nations prepares for these kinds of conflicts. Uh, they know that they will be called upon to provide shelter and food and water and resources to people, and so they want to be prepared. And so they plan based on previous conflicts. And their planning, uh, in their planning, they decided that they needed to be able to provide for 50,000 people. 50,000. And they had 500,000. So damage to public infrastructure was also unprecedented, leaving hundreds of thousands of people without adequate services, including electricity, uh, clean water, and quality health care. The Gaza power plant remains to this day inoperable, leaving people without uh, power 18 hours a day. Uh, this, of course, uh, you know that this means that people cannot adequately refrigerate food. They don't have access to um, communication with the outside world. I mean, the consequences go on and on for, for electricity outages. 30% of households are without access to water. Uh, the, uh, the business, the economy took a huge hit. 419 businesses and workshops were damaged and 128 completely destroyed. Um, 17,000 hectares of cropland were damaged, including greenhouses, irrigation systems, animal farms, and fishing boats. The education system also took a huge hit. 26 schools were completely destroyed, as along with 122 damaged. Um, this is a region that is 200 schools short already. Uh, they need 200 more schools to provide for the children that they have. The schools are already uh, working double shifts of students every day. Uh, the healthcare system was damaged, 17 hospitals out of 32, including three that have shut down completely, uh, along with 50 healthcare centers damaged. A third of the essential drugs and over half of the essential medical supplies have been out of stock during this war. 
Uh, one, of the prob one of the big problems that remains is that thousands of explosive remnants of war are distributed all around the Gaza Strip, um, uh, which are, includes inside schools and hospitals um, and places where people are returning to their homes, um, places that have, of course, been struck. And so this is providing a huge threat to children, to farmers, and to internally displaced people returning to their homes, as well as humanitarian workers. I mean, these numbers are impossible for me to comprehend. Um, so I want to tell you, I want to put a face to at least some of them, one face. Um, my husband has a dear friend named Ra'et, who has been his driver every time he's gone to Gaza over the last eight years, which has been every month to every few months he goes for a couple of days. And Ra'et drives him. And he, I've always heard about Ra'ed, and in Palestinian culture, uh, marriage is incredibly highly valued. And for years, Nathan was always given a lot of grief that he wasn't married. And when finally Ra'ed heard about me, he celebrated and couldn't wait to meet me. And finally, in May, I got to visit uh, through the Mennonite Central Committee. And Ra'ed made a huge deal about meeting me. And he, every, every three seconds, he said, you light up Gaza by being here. You light up Gaza by being here. And he gave me a little tour of Gaza City and of his neighborhood and um, told me what makes Gaza special, what makes the people of Gaza special. And I experienced him as a really uh, vibrant and charismatic person. Um, and Nathan always told me that he's also a very proud man and that any time he dropped Nathan off at the checkpoint to go back to Israel, uh, that he would refuse to discuss the bill. Nathan would say, what do I owe you? And I oh, oh, no. And so Nathan would have to just pay him what he thought he owed him because he would never discuss the bill. But of course, when we, we were able to visit uh, August 11th, it was the first day of the first stable ceasefire. We knew it would be stable because the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, had retreated out of uh, their ground invasion. So, so we knew that, we, knew, we were pretty sure it would hold, so we decided to go in. And of course, Ra'ed met us at the checkpoint. Um, this time, however, he was truly dejected. His shoulders were hunched, he wouldn't make eye contact, and he actually uh, asked Nathan to introduce him to an aid worker so he could get aid. He said, I've lost everything. His house was completely destroyed in an airstrike. It's the third time in six years that his house has been destroyed in Israeli airstrikes. Previously, he lost his wife and three of his children to airstrikes. So I got to visit this hospital. Um, this longtime partner of the PCUSA uh, it's small. It has a normal capacity of 50 beds, though they've added several more during the course of this war. They also increased their staff by 10, but I was told they need 10 more uh, for the number of patients that they have. I was, uh, I was uh, welcomed by the hospital director, Suhaila Tarazi, uh, who's been working there, I think, for decades. <laughs> Every time anyone's heard of this hospital, they know Suhaila. Um, and she was incredibly welcoming to me and incredible, had an incredible gift, uh, pre, uh, pastoral presence with all of the patients. She told me the staff were working 24 hour shifts on, 24 hours off. Um, one staff nurse was killed, she told me, um, along with most of her family. And she was found actually huddled over her baby and toddler trying to protect them. But of course, they passed away as well. But the rest of the staff continued to work around the clock, although Suhaila said, of course, it is very dangerous for them to move between their homes and the hospital. I was told that at that point in the day, around noon, the clinic, the outpatient clinic, had seen 113 people, uh, seen by three doctors and three nurses by noon. Um, and the burn unit had seen 30. They were short of medicine, short of medical supplies, and they were running out of fuel. I was given a tour of the burn unit, the outpatient clinic, and all the wards used to house patients with all kinds of wounds. What I noticed was that a lot of extended families were living packed into the room with their loved one, because of course whatever airstrike had injured their loved one had, had destroyed their home and made it uninhabitable. And I overheard doctors arguing with families that they needed to leave and give up the, the bed of their loved one so that another patient could come and be treated, and the families resisting um, because they had nowhere, nowhere else to go. But I also saw rooms that were empty of anyone but the patient because they were the only surviving member of their family. This was the case uh, with several patients that I visited. But I also met uh, many, many children as well, including a few of those in the photographs above. 
Um, I met the boy uh, in the upper right hand picture who was bragging to me that he had escaped to death, his own words. Uh, he was visiting his grandmother and a bomb hit a house n next door. And he ran away and in the process uh, saved his life. But he also broke his leg and needed surgery on it and that's what he was there at the hospital for. Um, I also met Mohammed in the picture on the bottom right, the little boy in the front. And he was bragging that he got better faster than his brothers. Um, and I got a chance to play with them, but as I was leaving the room, Suhaila told me that in the, the bomb blast that had injured him and his brothers had killed his mother, his grandmother, his aunt, and his entire aunt's family, and destroyed their home. On my way out, a mother asked me to take a picture of her little boy, the one in the left-hand picture. Um, and she didn't want to be in the picture herself, so she motioned for a doctor to come stand in the photo with him. But as soon as the doctor came over, he turned his head away and started weeping. And Suhaila said that he cries now every time he sees somebody in a white coat because he associates doctors with the pain of being treated for his burns. He was covered in burn dressings, as you can see. So I went to visit this hospital for a few reasons. I mean, one, they were, they were asking for a visit. They really wanted to share with us uh, their experiences. Um, and I wanted to go and, and through my presence, uh, give encouragement, uh, the hope that the church knew of their suffering, that we cared about their suffering, and that I would promise to come back and share their stories and their needs uh, with the church. But I don't want to end uh, on the story of, of the hospital. Um, I'd rather end on a happier note. Uh, this summer had other events occur as well, um, including our General Assembly of 2014. And now there are many actions that occurred at General Assembly that have been uh, controversial and painful to many people, including the divestment vote. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the Presbyterian Church USA um, identified three multinational companies that we determined to be involved in activities uh, that maintain the military occupation of Palestinian territories. Activities like building settlements, building the separation wall, maintaining the technology of the checkpoints, and also maintaining the blockade of Gaza. Uh, we determined, we've been discussing this vote for 10 years, uh, engaging with these corporations, trying to change their business practices, and eventually determined it wasn't working and we needed to divest our money. Uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, this has been a painful conversation and a painful vote for a lot of people. Um, people have felt it threatens their relationships with Jewish friends here in the States. Um, but I can tell you that where I live, uh, with all the people that I work with um, who do the just peace work I'm describing to you, every single one of them pleaded for us to take this action. And every single one of them not only thanked me afterwards, but continue to thank me every time I see them. Truly, truly incredible. They are so grateful. And I promise that I would share their words with you. And uh, so I just have a few quotes I want to share, including one from another friend of the PCUSA who works for Defense for Children International of Palestine. Um, he's a Christian Palestinian man from Bethlehem, and he said, the ones who are interested in the peace process in this country, the ones who are interested in ending this conflict without bloodshed, the ones who are still interested in a two-state solution, all these people, including the ones who love Israel, they need to divest. This is the last chance because five years from now, the situation will become permanent. Now we are witnessing the complete end of the two-state solution. The only option left is to exert pressure on Israel. The only other way left is bloodshed, a war. This is my biggest fear, that we are moving not only to the end of the two-state solution, but to the end of any peaceful solution. And Israel will pay the price. And a Jewish-Israeli partner of ours who works for an organization called Grassroots Jerusalem, which supports the grassroots organizers in Jerusalem, told me, by being invested in the companies that are making a profit off the occupation, you are, in essence, supporting the violence, supporting the oppression, the discrimination, the unemployment rates, the lack of access to health care, the deterioration of our biblical city. For me, the Peace USA divesting would mean that I knew there was another partner in creating a peaceful city in Jerusalem, an equal and just city, that we weren't forgotten as if Israel can do no wrong, that people knew that Israel, just like any other government, can do wrong, and that it needs to be held to similar standards as other, as other governments. Your votes, along with others, will affect corporations, 
and corporations will affect the Israeli government. That's how policy is made. So these were, these were interviews I did with our partners before the vote. And then during the week of General Assembly, of course, I was over there. I was going about business, my business as normal. And I had scheduled a day to visit the project sites of the YWCA of Palestine. They have a lot of amazing programs, including some in Ramallah that I visited. And as I was being introduced around to the different offices of the staff, one of them said to me, you're Presbyterian? And I said, yes. And she turns her laptop around to show me the backdrop of her screen which is a photo of a section of the separation wall near Bethlehem that said in graffiti, Presbyterians, please divest. And she said, I'm following you on Twitter. I said, this is a Muslim woman working for the YWCA in, in Ramallah. I was like, how did you find out about us? And she said that she follows Jewish Voice for Peace, who is widely advertising this vote. And she went on to talk for 15 minutes about how for her, uh, divestment was a women's rights issue because all violence and, and this conflict disproportionately affects women and girls. And as a woman and as a mother of girls, uh, she was pleading for us to divest. And I got a, a wonderful note from her after the vote. She said she stayed up until 3 in the morning with her husband watching the live webcam of the General Assembly. She wrote to me, although the vote passed by a thin difference, seven votes, it was really, really the best news we've heard in a long time. It gave us hope. It meant that people, if they were informed well, will stand by what's right, what's just, and be in line with their principles and values. It meant that money and profits should never be more important than human beings. I can say we slept with a smile that tomorrow could be better. I always tell my little daughters, Zina and Yasmin, that we Palestinian Muslims and Christians are not against Jews, we are against occupation. In the same way I tell our Presbyterian friends who voted for or against divestment, we are struggling to live freely and in dignity. We have lives and dreams that are not very different from yours. But sometimes little things are really dreams for us, the very basic things that you take for granted as Americans, we have to struggle to accomplish, like the right to education, the right to citizenship, the right to move, so rest assured that your vote has an impact on us. It assured us that you could hear our voice, that you chose to stand by justice and human rights. And for that, I and my family genuinely thank you. So there are other ways you can get involved in, in peacemaking and in this ministry. Uh, of course, I invite you to pray uh, for me and the work that I do, but of course also for all the people of Israel-Palestine who need your prayers. I invite you to learn more about our mission partners and also about this conflict. I think that as Americans and as Christians, we have a very particular investment and influence on this conflict, more so than any around the world. Uh, it is the, the, the place where our faith was born. Uh, it is also a nation that, has, uh, that we have given a lot of money to and a lot of diplomatic cover to, and that we as Americans, the more we know, the more we can be a positive influence in peacemaking there. So I invite you to also educate others uh, from your media outlets to your political representatives, to your pastors, to your friends and family. Um, I also invite you to explore how you might follow the General Assembly guidelines on investment and on boycott. Uh, I can always connect you to resources uh, to show you what products. So one thing I didn't mention is that we had taken an action at the previous General Assembly to boycott illegal products coming out of illegal Israeli settlements. Um, and I can help you figure out which ones those are. Uh, there's also the possibility, of course, of becoming a sister congregation uh, of a Palestinian Christian congregation in Jerusalem or the West Bank. And there's a lot of ways that can look, and I'm happy to help you think that through. I'd also love for you to be in touch with me. Uh, several, several congregations, members of congregations I've visited in the past, wrote to me this summer, said they were praying for, for me and for the people there, and I pass those messages along, and I myself get a lot of encouragement from that. I also produce a newsletter every month, um, updating folks on our mission partners and also helping to uh, analyze the current events of that month. Um, I have a sign-up sheet over here uh, if you'd like to be on that, that email list. I promise it's one email a month, and that's it. <laughs> I've never broken my word. Um, 
Of course, we're a world mission would ask that I invite you to give financially to this ministry as well. Uh, I also invite you to come and see. As my friend told me in seminary, this is a conflict that really requires you to come and see firsthand uh, what's happening there in order to understand. And it's also really important to visit our, our, our partners there as, uh, as it provides a lot of encouragement and solidarity to them. And I'm leading a trip next April uh, with World Mission to visit our partners and to learn about their context. And I have flyers for that up there, up here as well, as a, along with prayer cards that you might remember us in your prayers. Uh, for those of you who'd like to learn more about our partners or about this conflict, pardon me, I've, I've included several of resources that I highly recommend. Uh, everything from fact sheets that different organizations provide to authors and documentaries as well as alternative news sources, because mainstream American media does not provide uh, up-to-date, accurate information on this conflict. And so I've included some Israeli and Palestinian news sources, as well as um, other ones that I highly regard. Maps are incredibly essential in understanding this conflict, and UNOCHA produces good ones. Um, our long-term partner, Bet Salem, Israeli partner, Bet Salem, documents human rights violations, and they have a lot of uh, fact sheets and glossaries on their website. I can provide it to your, to your contact folks here. Um, and of course, I recommend that you uh, look up our General Assembly policies because this denomination has had an incredibly uh, prophetic and, and uh, courageous stand on this conflict throughout the years. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm really grateful to be here and be among you tonight. And of course, I'm happy to answer questions. <laughs> I think a lot of us who, who felt a lot of grief and empathy over the course of this summer had the same question. I know that I did. But uh, on the other hand, I also don't know what it's like to have the experience that the population living in Gaza has had. Everything from being a refugee since 1948 to being under blockade since 2007. Uh, I don't know what it's like to provide for my family in the midst of a destroyed economy. I don't know what it's like to not be able to leave the town where I grew up, not be able to get an education elsewhere, not be able to visit family elsewhere. Uh, I don't know what it's like to feel like there's no political alternative. Uh, so in the, in the context in which I described for you, everything from 1948 to 67 to the blockade, uh, I think that there's no, there's no true justification for, for rockets that are indiscriminate and, and, and target civilians. At the same time, I also don't know what it's like to be in their situation and not feel like you have, uh, A, any other option, uh, and B, to, to, to also have the right to resist occupation. Israel has the right to defend itself. The people of, Israel, of Palestine also have the right to resist military occupation. That's a right that they have under international law as well. Um, I, of course, we all wish the violence would end, uh, but I, I think that uh, when, there's, when there's such asymmetry of power that you have between Israel and Gaza, between Israel and Palestine in general, Israel has a state. It has an army, it has a navy, it has a military, an air force. Uh, it has uh, control over resources. Uh, it has so much more power than the Palestinians and that the bulk of responsibility in ending the conflict is really uh, on, on the people with the power. Please. Uh, yes, um, Well, they were still a political party, so I doubt it. Um, the Hamas organizing charter that she's mentioning is incredibly racist. 
It's incredibly anti-Semitic. It's incredibly violent. Uh, it's, it's, sh it's truly shocking in, in those qualities. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's also uh, 20, 29 years old, something like this. And, and since the time of its writing, uh, Hamas decided to become a political party. And when they did so, they really changed their tone and tactics to an important degree. Um, unfortunately, uh, uh, regretfully, uh, in my opinion, they have not renounced their charter, uh, but they have made clear in, in statements they've made to the media and statements they've made publicly that they would, uh, they would be satisfied with a Palestinian state within the 1967 borders, which essentially recognizes the state of Israel. And they've done so for several years. Um, so while, the, while I wish they would renounce this charter and, and destroy it, uh, their argument, my husband does a lot of work with Hamas, and one of, the thing, one of the conversations he's had with their officials over the years is, why don't you get rid of this? It provides, you, you clearly don't believe a lot of this anymore. You're willing to acknowledge Israel. You're willing to submit to uh, a Palestinian state within the 67 borders. Why don't you renounce this document? It, it really hurts you, and it, it's terrible. <laughs> And the response is that they also have a constituency to, that they are responsible for, the politicians, and that it would really look like caving to their, to their constituents. Uh, um, so so it's, it is, I really wish that they would renounce it. It's, it's a terrible, uh, shocking document. Um, but since, that, since the time of its writing, they have really changed their tactics and their tone in ways that, that make them uh, a party that is pragmatic and can be negotiated with. I agree, and I was one of those people <laughs> until about seven years ago. Um, I mean, one way, of course, is to share the news resources that I that you can have access to. Uh, I can share with your pastor, with my contacts here, um, those alternative news sources that are Israeli news sources and Palestinian news sources, um, also news sources from from folks like Foreign Policy. Um, you can share those news news resources with your colleagues, your friends, and family. But I also encourage you to hold your local media accountable. Uh, when you see uh, articles being written that don't describe the full view, that don't have another perspective involved, write to your editor and, and tell them so. This is really important. If they don't hear from people like us um, who want to hear the whole story, uh, they're, they're not going to publish it. Um, so hold your media accountable. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But they constantly go through this, and they were saying that Hamas is the one that started this last action, you know, not the uh, Israelis. But you said something about that they had attacked with the planes first in Palestine. Is, is that correct? It's all where you choose to put the starting point. I mean, none of those things are lies. I mean, those aren't lies. Uh, I don't want you to think that those are lies. Um, 
I tried to paint the picture that you could start this conflict this summer in a lot of different places. So when people say that Hamas started it, you could go back to that point where Hamas fired those nine rockets and claimed responsibility for them and say that was the start of this war. What I tried to do is show you there's another start where you could say the six Hamas folks who were killed in this vehicle. You could go back and say the blockade. You could go back and say 1948. That, that everyone can pick a different starting point and say that this started it, right? Um, so that's not a lie. The, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's one presentation of the truth. Um, it's also not a lie that Hamas fired hundreds of rockets into Israel. Uh, they did. Uh, they, did. They fired indiscriminately on civilians. Um, not effectively, uh, partly because the technology and the resources they have to build their own rockets um, don't provide them with enough technology to be accurate or, or far-ranging. And, and also because Israel has a really highly developed defense system. Without that defense system, it's possible, uh, probable that more civilians would have been killed. Um, but you can also see in the highly disproportionate loss of life, six civilians to uh, 2,200 civilians um, that, that the use of force uh, was, was highly disproportionate. Mm -hmm, that's true. So I can only imagine if I was an Israeli living on the border there that that would be really terrifying to me. Um, petrifying. I mean, I would, I would have fled just like a lot of folks in southern Israel fled the region. Um, of course, a lot of the civilian population in Gaza would have liked to flee uh, and couldn't. Um, and at the same time, I would hope that the citizens in southern Israel would ask themselves why Gaza, Gaza residents were not residents, militants, <laughs> the civilians of course were not doing this, militants in Gaza, why would they be building tunnels under my house? <laughs> and that there are a lot of big uh, justice issues, uh, answers to that question, that there's a whole context about why mili militants in Gaza exist, why they're trying to get out, why they would be attacking people in Israel, um, and, I, and I'm, it's unfortunate that I don't think that Israeli citizens are asking themselves those questions. Well, I, I really wanted, I want to um, uh, shed light on this misperception that there are all of these Arab countries that want Israel destroyed. At a different point in time, I think maybe that could have been true and accurate, but at this point, uh, all of the Arab countries have offered a peace agreement to Israel on the condition that they end the military occupation. Um, and of course, Israel does have peace agreements with some countries. Uh, they have no issues with Jordan. They don't really have issues with Egypt. Um, and all the other countries around them have offered them a peace agreement if they would end the occupation. And of course, they haven't. Um, Hamas itself, while, I, while uh, admittedly their, their charter and some of their early rhetoric was, was about destroying Israel, um, they have since that time uh, said publicly, made official statements that they would accept a two-state solution in the 67 borders. And so that's not representative of an organization that wants to destroy you. Um, so I, don't, I think that that's a, that is a, a perception based on history that's not currently relevant.
recognize that they have an opportunity here to really do something significant. Mm. Uh, do something to defuse this situation. Uh, uh, they blame the rocket. They have to fire back. They blockade. They block the tunnels. They block the Turks. They're the power brokers. They're the ones that have the ability and the resources to do something uh, to defuse this worldwide situation. I agree with you. Hmm? I agree with you, yeah. Let's just see, just one second, see if someone who hasn't spoken has a question. Please, please. I believe we do have a role. Uh, and this is why I think that my work is so rewarding. Uh, because the hope that I see is in the knowledge and the awareness of people like you. People like me and you. Um, as I said, we as Christians, uh, have a particular stake in this piece of real estate. Uh, I hope that we all care deeply about the suffering of all the people that currently live in the land uh, where our faith was born, that we hope, and that we hope that there will continue to be Christians there. There's been a historic indigenous Christian population that are being uh, uh, pushed out. Many are emigrating in, in high, high rates because of this occupation. Um, and really, the, the Christian population there uh, is important partially for, I think, our Christian heritage, but also to serve as a witness to the reality that this is not a religious conflict. This is not a conflict between Jews and Muslims. Uh, it's a conflict about land and about politics and about occupation. And the Christian population there really serves to, uh, to provide a witness to that fact. Um, we also have a, an incredible stake in this particular conflict as Americans. Uh, we send a lot, $3 billion over there in foreign aid. Uh, Israel receives more of our foreign aid uh, than Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America and Central America combined. Um, and they're a first world country. Uh, so we have a huge stake uh, financially. We have a huge stake diplomatically. We continue to veto UN resolutions that would hold Israel accountable for this occupation. Every single time it comes up in the UN Security Council, America vetoes it. Um, so we have a huge influence on this conflict. If America decided to solve it, I believe that we could. If we decided to use leverage that we have. So far, whenever we've, negoti we've been involved in negotiations, we refuse to use the leverage that we have over Israel. Um, and I believe that uh, as Christians, as American Christians, uh, the more that we know about this conflict, the more that we spread that awareness uh, amongst each other, amongst our friends, our pastors, our political representatives, and our media, um, increasingly it will change the rhetoric around this conflict in this country, and it will have an impact. I truly believe that. Hamas is a political party that, that won elections, uh, and uh, resistance to them winning elections uh, resulted in them controlling just the Gaza Strip, while their opposing party took control in the West Bank. And that party in the West Bank is what the, the, the dominant party of the Palestinian Authority, um, and so far that's the party that the international community has been willing to deal with. Um, the Hamas political party does include militants, in it, but it, of course, is also a function. It's a it's a government, so it has other it has civil servants and um, people who probably many of whom don't want to consider violence as well. But this is a political party under which they're being ruled. Um, as to how much influence they have, there's a lot of hatred, honestly, and and mistrust between the two parties. Um, unity between the two parties has been seen as sort of a, a prerequisite for there being a real pe lasting peace. 
Because if you make peace negotiations with a leader who doesn't represent the entire population, um, you don't have a sustainable peace. You've left a whole bunch of people out who are not going to consider that negotiation legitimate. They're not going to consider it to be having done on their behalf, which it wasn't. Um, so for a long time, Israel has said, how can we negotiate with um, half, half the population? Uh, we don't have a partner for peace. Now, of course, with the unity government, they're saying, well, we can't negotiate with terrorists, and so we, don't, we still don't have a partner for peace, uh, even though, of course, Hamas, as I said, has acknowledged that they're willing to have a, a Palestinian state on the 67 borders. Um, so at this point, we're really, we really don't know. It's a big question mark uh, how the unity government is going to move forward. They had a, a meeting of the unity cabinet in Gaza last Thursday, um, but all the sources uh, that my husband meets with, who are top uh, officials in both parties, um, say that a lot of it is for show in order to get uh, the pledges that, that countries have made to Gaza's reconstruction were made on the condition that this unity government moved forward. And so they think that, that it might just be a show to get this money for reconstruction, um, and it might not actually be sustainable. So that is something to pray for, because really this unity government going forward is the only way that the Palestinians can be united and be a united, uh, have united negotiations for peace. So what you're asking is, is a really big uh, question mark in the air right now. One more. Mm -hmm. Well, really, the short answer is because we're blocking them. Uh, the Americans, when we do our vetoes in the Security Council, what, what, what nations, what the Security Council has been trying to do is, is really make resolutions that would hold Israel accountable and end the occupation and, and make peace uh, between the two peoples. Uh, but because of our vetoes, none of these ever move forward. Um, and so the United Nations is really blocked from doing peacemaking regarding Israel-Palestine. Of course, as you know, they do a lot of providing aid. Uh, they, they facilitate uh, a lot of services, to re all the services to Palestinian refugees. Um, but in terms of actually participating in negotiations, uh, they've been blocked by the U.S. Well, uh, I hope that uh, there has been some hope and some uh, promise uh, embedded in the bad news tonight. Um, I really do believe that we all have a part to play in influencing this conflict. I covet your prayers for this ministry, and, and I'm really grateful that you've invited me to be here with you tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.